Okay, good morning. My name is Sarah Ladislaw. I head the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS. Uh, I want to welcome all of you to yet another installment of our series, Climate Change in the National and Corporate Interest. Uh, for those of you who have not attended one of these before, uh, one of the things that we set out to do about a year ago was to consistently invite people uh, from companies and governments and different walks of society to come and talk about why doing things on climate change uh, are in their basic corporate interest, if you're a company, or basic national interest if you represent a government. Uh, and today is a real pleasure for a number of reasons to have uh, Jonathan Pershing, who heads up the environment program at the Hewlett Foundation, to talk about the way in which Hewlett is thinking about climate change and the way it conducts its philanthropy in light of the challenges that we face. Uh, it's a great event for two reasons. One, it is starting on sort of a departure, uh, a new wing of this climate change and national and corporate interest series that we've been doing, which is to look at uh, other institutions that are really important to society and to uh, the climate challenge writ large that are not just companies, not just uh, 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 governments as well. So I think it'll be great to have uh, some additional speakers along that line. Um, but more uh, importantly, it's just such a pleasure to have Jonathan back on the East Coast uh, and here to talk about climate change. I first met Jonathan when he was working at the World Resources Institute and I had just come out of government to come here and work at CSIS. Uh, and no matter what position he's been in, whether it's been at the State Department as a climate envoy or DOE working on uh, sort of the technology and policy aspects of the climate challenge, he's always done us this enormous favor of coming and giving a masterclass lecture on where everything stands globally and what we should care about. And so I am just thrilled on a very wonky level uh, that he's gonna do that again this morning. So um, this is being webcast, so if you please silence your phones uh, before the event and we'll open it up for questions uh, at the end. I am thrilled to welcome uh, Jonathan to the stage, so thank you. So thanks very much. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I'm struck, as I was walking down the street, I have my red raincoat because it was raining and it's kind of chilly in Washington, that everyone here is wearing black or gray. Uh, and so there's a remarkable difference between the California model and the East Coast model in terms of like what colors you wear. Uh, I'm struck a little bit, uh, this is a very negative characterization, I'm struck a little bit by um, the first few times that I was in China. And as you walked around China in the late 19, this was the late 1980s, everyone's wearing the kind of very drab colors. China today is actually full of incredible color. And in some ways, I kind of wonder whether we've gone backwards to the gray and black era, and China's kind of got life and vibrancy. Uh, California's still wearing red. So um, it's come out to the West Coast. It's very, very interesting. With that very uh, a curious place to start, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much, Sarah, for inviting me. What I wanted to do today is really talk a bit about uh, how I see the climate agenda unfolding. And I think it's, it, it's topical and timely. It turns out that you guys probably don't need much persuasion about the science, and I won't really talk about that. But every single time you turn around, the science is being corroborated as opposed to otherwise. And so let's give uh, as an assumption here that the science is telling us we have to move. And the question that I really want to address is how and how the rest of the world is seeing that agenda. And to a certain extent, you can almost dismiss the first question and just worry about the second, which is to say, dismiss whether the science is real or not, and really look at the rest of the world is acting, because in their actions lies, I think, an important message for us uh, in the United States. So with that in mind, if I get this thing the right way and can advance these slides, there we go. Um, this is where we've been historically on this problem. Many of you have seen a variant of this particular graphic. 
then have to decarbonize the electricity sector. So this is the rate of decarbonization that's projected through a variety of different sources. This again comes back from the Climate Works report. And at the, at the bottom, those, those dotted lines, that's two degrees and 1.5. So we're not yet on the trajectory of decarbonizing the electricity system. It's gotta be quite steep and it's nowhere near steep enough. We're still putting in new coal facilities in China. We're still putting in a few, although almost none right now in India. There's basically a moratorium. So you've got nonetheless significant carbon assets in these places. And at the end of the day, who's leading on that discussion? It's actually India and China. So if you think that decarbonization is where your economic future lies and you're not investing in this, don't worry, others are, in 10 years you may not have that market option anymore. And this is the way it plays out. At the moment, this is the new manufacturing capacity of PVs. It turns out pretty low value added. India is likely to take over from China, at least based on the most recent numbers that we've got. And that suggests that manufacturing capacity for the PV solar panel is shifting None of it's the United States, none of it's Europe. This is India and China having a battle for who gets that particular asset value. And at the other end, it's installed capacity. Who's putting it in? India and China are putting it in. And they're putting it in in volumes that dwarf those of the United States. So again, if you want to think about competition in this sector, where are you playing and how are you investing? If you withdraw from that debate, others are right there already filling in that space that we have chosen to abdicate and the EV manufacturer is no different. And here is the, the, the numbers in this particular case that come from Bloomberg. This is the BNF numbers on the expectations for light duty vehicle fleets. 40% of all EVs sold in the world were sold in China. And we should be very clear about the rate of change there. It is not a short lived or, 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 long, or sorry, a long term uh, shift. It's a very, very rapid change in the instant. I was in China about a year and a half ago in Beijing and every single three uh, little uh, three stroke uh, um, moped and uh, small scooter was an internal combustion engine. I was there about uh, two and a half weeks ago. Every single one in Beijing was electric. Pretty fast, it kind of helps to have an economy which you can just turn buttons on and off and things move and there are huge consequences for driving the ICE ones, but in the space of a year, they essentially electrified the entire scooter fleet and everybody bikes on one of those in Beijing. But it's not just there. The city of Shenzhen uh, has 17 and a half thousand buses. In the span of five years, they electrified every single one. Not just some of them, that's a bus fleet much larger than that of New York City, which is the largest one that we've got, and they did it in five years, and they're way ahead of the curve, and they bought BYDs, and that's a Chinese company making Chinese buses installed in Chinese markets. So to me, it becomes a question of, it's not that whether we'll go there or not, it's how fast we go there and where it's gonna end up. And here is the uh, additional version about the projections of ICEs versus EV sales. On the left side, what you can see is ICE in the blue and EV on the bottom on the right. That only goes to 2040, that's as far out as this figure goes. But at that point, what you're looking at is sales representing almost 55% of the, of the total. That's a remarkably quick change we're not making those same investments. If you take a look at China, China's got an entire policy seeking to drive that. The Europeans, while it's a much lesser uh, level of aggressiveness than we had thought it might be when the proposal was first uh, put out there, the Europeans have a policy. The United States policy, with the exception of California, is to walk away from standards. It makes a difference how you approach these kinds of questions. If the market is in fact gonna look like this, the United States is not gonna be competing in that market. It's others who will compete. It's Mahindra and Tata who are taking this at an enormously aggressive level in India. It's BYD that's doing this with Geely in China. It's not Ford, it's not GM. That's not where it's happening. And to a certain extent, our, mock, our market model and the policies that we put into place are not driving this level of support. And you can see that on the right side, those colors at the top, that's essentially all of Europe. The United States is in there at the bottom, and you can see it kind of grows, but it doesn't grow very quickly. And this is the optimistic view that comes out of BNF as a function of, China, of the American market largely driven by California. This predates some of the proposals that are currently floating around as whether or not the California exemption should still apply. So how do you think about this question when you think about competitiveness? This is clearly gonna have to be part of the equation. I wanna turn for just a minute then to look at the Chinese side. Where are they gonna go and how do we think about that agenda? This is the composition of the Chinese economy looking back in time and what you can see is a fairly rapid growth in the services sector, a decline in the share of agriculture, but a substantial and yet slightly declining share of industry. 
industry is still substantially driving the Chinese GDP and where the economy is. But year on year, what we're seeing over the period of time uh, is uh, from 2002 through 2015, a decline in the uh, production and the demand in virtually every single sector. So in the first on the left, that's cement. They've virtually completed the build out in terms of their co collective infrastructure. In the middle, what you've got is steel. Uh, and what you're seeing is a sharp decline in steel. Then you've got total primary energy demand down, although still growing slightly on a year-on-year -year basis, nonetheless sharply declining from where it had been at its peak. And then you've got coal demand declining quite sharply. That's the domestic demand, and yet the productive capacity for all those things has not shifted. Hence, Chinese incredible interest in overseas investment. Because they've got domestic capacity, where does it go? It goes into the international market. And you see some of that in this particular figure. This slide is taken from the Chinese government statistics, and what you see there is the exports of some of the key commodities, many of which are remarkably high greenhouse gas emitting commodities. Look at the top one, that's fertilizer, on the order of 50% of Chinese production is going out to export. The next line below that, that's aluminum. You're looking at on the order of 25 or 20, uh, peaked about 25, about 20% of aluminum, and even some of the other ones are in there at 10 to 15% going out, steel and paper. They have excess capacity. It comes across the board. It is in things ranging from the pr products themselves into the manufacturing capacity to create those products. China is exporting coal and coal capacity because not just that it has coal, that's not what it's doing. It has the capacity to build coal plants. It's building a new coal plant or had been at its peak one a week. Nobody in the world has got the kind of capacity to put in infrastructure the way the Chinese do. What do you do with all those workers, all those jobs, all that excess overhang? You export it. Here is the Belt and Road Initiative. Export writ large. And you kind of think about the scale of this agenda, 70 odd countries, a population of the better part of 5 billion people, economies collectively worth $21 trillion, 62% of the world's GDP, and the Chinese are planning at least a trillion, and some numbers range up as high as, as 8 to 10 trillion in terms of where they are in total collective investment in the region. And it ties directly to the previous picture. So the notion that the United States is going to get up and say, we don't really like your program, forget it. That's not going to drive change. Much more to the point is, your program is what your program is. How do we influence where you invest? How do we get a piece of that pie? The pie is enormous. It's not as if it can't be shared or that we haven't got assets that we could bring to the table to make real use of this with the US's own industrial capacity and ability to move forward with high tech and options for value add and questions of our own export structure. The BRI countries are also critical on the climate change side. How do we think about that agenda? At the uh, bottom, that's China all by itself. Added in blue, that's the total of all the BRI countries. If I put the two of those together, it's bigger than the rest of the world combined. So where are we going with this set of countries? And where, perhaps at least as much to the point, where is China going with these countries? Here's a number about where China's going. I've taken here at the top in each one of these figures what the countries themselves say they want to do about climate change. These come from the nationally determined contributions of each state. And I've just picked three here, three kind of interesting ones. They're all in Southeast Asia, so this very, very close to the Chinese economic and commercial and trade orbits. Indonesia. Indonesia said it was going to have a 26% reduction in BA, low BAU, and including 23% coming from new and renewable energy. Where is the Chinese investment there? About $7.3 billion since 2005. It's all coal. Not exactly a consistent investment in terms of where China's going domestically, but certainly speaks to Chinese overhang and coal capacity. Vietnam, an 8% emissions reduction below BAU with 25% more of international supports available. At the end of the day, all $6.4 billion from the Chinese Development Bank has been in coal. What about Bangladesh? Interesting kind of an option, 5%, not as aggressive, but it's a remarkably poor place. Below BAU in power, transport, and industry, maybe going as high as 15% if they can get some international support. Chexim, Chinese Export-Import uh, Group, and 60% for coal, the rest for oil and gas. Where's the renewables? China's installing more renewable capacity than any other country in the world by virtually a factor of two on the United States. It's as big as the rest of the world combined. Why is it not exporting renewables? Why couldn't we, as a policy matter, influence that choice? What would it take if we wanted to influence that choice? It's not saying China can't export, they're going to export. But the question is, what do they do with those assets? Which ones do they prioritize? Where is that going to be coming from? 
And some progress is being made, but it's still relatively modest. On the left side, and this is some work that Kevin Gallagher has done looking at global finance, it's incredibly interesting. Those of you who have a chance to read some of his analyses, I think based on some very, very substantive data. 2003 to 2013, about 104 billion total. And what you can see there is the, the three, uh, of the, the starting at the top left, uh, coal, oil, and gas into the orange. That's the fossil fuel number. It's actually been diversified and a substantial share now going into non-fossil fuel. But at the end of the day, it's a larger pie. The total amount in fossil fuel is about the same. How do you take a look and what shifts can you make and how do you drive the alternative and what's the long-term structure? Others are also investing though. So I don't wanna limit the story just on China. So if we take a look at what's going on here, what you've got ultimately here is about in 2014, about 18 trillion, about 22 trillion total investment. This is uh, social responsible investing across the board from all the countries in the world. It doesn't include China in this particular instance because their structure is quite different. But you've got Europe and the US and Canada, Australia and New Zealand, and then you've got Japan making massive investments in this space. So it's not as if the capacity of the world is dwarfed by China, exactly the opposite. The world's capacity is immense and China represents only a fraction of that, we are being a little bit set up to say, China's the boogeyman and we can't play. I think that's at least as much a function of the fact that we haven't engaged. We have assets, they too could be redirected. SRI right now thinks about governance, thinks about broad environmental questions. You know what, it's had virtually no consideration of climate. That's not been a focus. So the SRI pieces may just as well invest in what they call clean coal as invest in things like renewables. How do you think about that future market? Where is the investment coming in for renewables, for high uh, efficiency vehicles, or for electric vehicles? What are we doing about the heavy duty truck fleet? How do we decarbonize the industrial sector? Those are all pieces that fit into this asset class and are not being the focus of current investment, but they to me suggests an opportunity where if we're looking for an alternative where the United States plays, it's not the Chinese managed economy, it's the steering of this very substantial asset pool. And we're beginning to see some of that going forward in terms of how investors are demanding that future. And to me, this is one of the most interesting developments over the course of the last couple of years. It's not so much that we have the Paris Agreement, that's an essential piece, it's the Paris Agreement and the collective commitment around this agenda is changing the way investors think about their risk and their climate accounting. So these are carbon risk resolutions that have been put forward to these companies over the course of the last year and a half. And what you see now is that some of them still haven't made it, Kinder Morgan, which is essentially a, a gas company, a gas pipeline company, still is only at less than half, but the Exxon, the Occidental Petroleum number, the PPL numbers, those have now all passed. We're beginning to see a fundamental shift, and they've passed not because of protests by small environmental groups, but because BlackRock is in, State Street is in, CalPERS is in. This is a fundamental reorientation of how large holders of assets and investments see the potential for risk and their long-lived capital stocks. To me, that's the fundamental shift, and that's the asset strength that we get to play with. That's not the Chinese model of a directed and controlled system. That's a much more free market structure. But let's be clear, the market sees risk here and is calling upon companies to reconsider how they are making internal business decisions to account for that. And in my mind, that's the place that we ultimately have to play. Let me kind of wrap this up and then we can have some conversation about it. So I think there's a couple of things here. The first one is that there's no question that decarbonization is coming. The question is how fast and whether we're on the kind of trajectory that we've all sought. And while people here in this country are dismissive of what happened in the Paris Agreement, that turns out not to be the case for much of the rest of the world, which has essentially said, yeah, we did it. We think it's the right answer. Tough, we don't quite know how to get there. We've got a set of preliminary steps. It makes it much more difficult because the United States is not playing, but we know how to do that broadly, the, the, what the commitment is, and we're gonna start working on that agenda. So if you are thinking about your assets and your investment and your competitiveness, and that's not part of your thinking, you've got a remarkably parochial view, and almost certainly you will lose. Other countries are leading in virtually every single one of these spaces, and China is in no small measure in front in the vast majority. And that includes everything from AI to EVs to, to PV manufacture and installation. So if we look at that as our future, where is that gonna go? And it ties back not just to the installed capacity, but it ties back into who's owning the supply chain. If I take a look at the whole conversation on rare earth elements, which is no longer quite as, uh, as much of a topic today as it was a few years ago, it's still a market that's largely controlled by China. And the costs and the implications of that going forward are quite substantial. 
And that competition is going to be one that we're going to be facing, whether we think it's appropriate or not, it's going to be something that we face. And there are a whole set of risks that climate change itself poses, physical risks as well as these risks in the transition. And unless you take those opportunities, someone else will step in and the company which you thought was going to be a success and a big winner, having not done so, will no longer be anywhere near as effective. And in my mind, that requires a degree of leadership. And we've somewhat abdicated that space. Not entirely. There's an enormous amount going on. The states are still doing things. Cities are still doing things. The corporate community is way in front of the American federal government. And at the end of the day, if we don't think about that agenda and see how we support that agenda, we will end up facing others who are much more coherent in their collective policy, where the government and the private sector and civil society are more aligned on an agenda, and that ends up having enormous benefit in terms of global competition. And that's a function not just of what you do at home, but how you compete overseas. The global market is no longer an American market. The American market is still influential, still significant. But if we look at 2050, it's less than 15% of the total. How do you think about that agenda? You think about that agenda as a global player, that agenda as part of a larger system, that agenda against the consequences of the climate change structure and the technologies and the policies that are called for, and you start playing now to make yourself a winner in that future world. So thanks very much. All right, thanks, Jonathan. And I know we're going to make a lot of time for questions, just because I know you've got a lot of friends and people uh, in the audience who'd love to ask you all the tough questions uh, based on your talk. So one of the things I want to get to is you talk about a shift from focus on near-term emission reduction to deep decarbonization and the goals that um, that those longer term visions encourage in terms of people's political thinking and the governments, but also in commercial thinking in terms of companies. You're going around the world talking to people about this. Do you feel like that is a kind of shift in strategy and prioritization that you see reflected with the governments and the companies that you talk with? No. Okay. I see it emerging, but I don't see it as adopted. Mm. Uh, and by that, I say that um, there, there are a number of, of, of different debates that are underway. So let's start with China, which I think is one of the more interesting ones. The Chinese had a, have this annual meeting called the China Development Forum, and I, I was, happened to be there a couple of weeks ago, uh, and it was the first chance for rather a public rollout in the context of the newly formed government that Xi has created following the last party Congress. Uh, so we all know he's had his term extended. Uh, we don't know how long that's been for, but nonetheless, we have an extended term. But he's also got a whole series of new people, and the new people are looking at what they want to do. I was struck by the structure of the meeting. It's about 60% uh, Chinese speakers, very, very high level. It's not Xi himself who speaks, but it's much of his cabinet. So his financial cabinet, his development people, his finance minister, uh, the head of NDRC, uh, the vice premier. So very, very high level. And then a series of uh, non-Chinese speakers. The co-chair of the session formally was Tim Cook from Apple. What's interesting is that every single one of the non-Chinese speakers put climate change in their opening remarks. Everybody. That includes Tim Cook, but that also includes Angel Gurria, who's the head of the OECD. Uh, that includes uh, people like Pascal Lamy, who's the former head of the WTO, who's speaking on this agenda. So you've got an extraordinary range of people. Larry Summers spoke and put this way at the top of his agenda. Not a single Chinese speaker put climate change in their opening remarks. Not one. On the other hand, when pressed about the agenda, Every Chinese speaker could speak to it at great length, and frankly, with a very robust framing on the response. Two things suggest that to me. One, it has been downgraded, largely because the US has downgraded it, and it's not worth making this the elevated point if the American administration doesn't want to play. Two, that they're still playing with exactly the same agenda they had before, and it's a, an iteration of five-year programs as opposed to a long-term model. And three, that uh, at the end of the day, the downgrading is going to make a difference and we can't expect China to lead on a long-term policy framework. That's one part, but the second part is that I've also ended up talking to some of the ministers and a number of the people working on their teams, and they're all thinking about the implications for the Belt and Road in terms of long-term strategy, and they all go out as far as 2040 and in many cases 2050. And in that structure, they're looking at where Chinese investment goes. And they're thinking about the model of how much they have to have in coal and how much they can perhaps have in alternative fuels. And right now it's a domestic problem, not an international problem, but at least it is under consideration. At the other end, I look at the EU. And the EU is looking at things in a pretty interesting fashion, but it's an enormous disarray. 
And at the moment, they're trying to figure out what Merkel structure is going to look like, trying to figure out what, what happens to Brexit, think about where Macron can play and what kind of alliances he'll be able to forge in the context of, frankly, a very divided community. You have Poland aggressively pushing against a serious long-term strategy, certainly when it speaks to coal. You don't have, in many cases, the structure of Hungary is no different and no better. Uh, you've got dynamics that really split the north and the south, as well as the east and the west in Europe. So you've got much, much less coherence, and you're nearing the end of the current uh, uh, structure of the commission, and we'll see what happens to the next iteration of that commission. Notwithstanding that, virtually every northern European country has got a 2050 strategy in play. And so I look at this and I say, as it developed, as it evolved, yes. Is it part and parcel of an underlying and formal decision-making structure? Not that far along yet. Mm. And then finally, I take a look at what's going on in the commercial community. And what's going on now, in my mind, among, in this space, perhaps most significantly, is the work that was launched by Mark Carney and run in a task force by Mike Bloomberg in uh, looking at carbon disclosure and risks attached to the carbon disclosure discussion. And from that perspective, what I think is fascinating is that they've called for long-term scenarios and strategies. What have companies done against those? Well, Exxon produced one in which they basically declared that they had no real risk to any of their asset base. Exxon has assets that will certainly be there in 2050, but they've made the assumption that there is still some oil in the 2050 horizon and they will be the least cost producer. And as a consequence, because of the least cost producer, there will be no risk to that asset. That's a remarkable conclusion in my mind. I don't find it particularly compelling in terms of how they set it up. Nonetheless, they make that claim, they do the analysis and end up, oddly enough, in a place that's exactly where they'd been before they started. So to me, it's that kind of question that's still being debated. I think it's fascinating. We know one of the things uh, we look across the uh, two degree scenarios for various companies, both in the oil and gas sector and outside. And, and you know, everybody, by virtue of this exercise, which is disclosure to investors, assumes their competitiveness going forward. It's sort of like you know, on the other side of the ledger, Permian oil production. You know, there's 20 million barrels coming out of the Permian if you believe everybody's numbers and everybody wants their investors to believe their numbers. So um, one other question uh, before I want to open it up. I, so I, you know, you also spend a lot of time at Hewlett and quite frankly in the roles that you've occupied before speaking to the environmental and the climate community at large. And one of the things that we see particularly in this time in the US uh, case is a lot of uh, sort of discussion once again about, and, and a lot of times these are discussions that have been around for a long time, but you know, should we be investing more in you know, new technologies versus deploying the ones that we have today? Or should we be looking at all renewable strategies given you know, the situation that we are in and the, the time that we've lost? Uh, or should we be looking at all of, all of the above strategy that includes nuclear and CCS? And in a way, those sort of debates seem to have flared up again within the community. Given the view that you're looking at and the focus that you have on commercial strategy and policy enabling environments, do you think those are really important discussions that we should be having? Or do you think that they're sort of distraction towards these longer term strategic aims? Uh, like how do you change the way that investment is going in, in things like the Belt and Road Initiative? I mean, how do you think about where we are in that? I have not seen a single model in which uh, any individual technology or sector is sufficient to the solution. So every model that I've seen suggests that if you do everything you can think about doing in every sector we've got, you maybe reach the outcome that we see. Mm -hmm. So the notion that you can basically pick and choose among them and say this is good and that one's bad is much less likely to be the right answer than every single thing is required and the more you can do in every single place, the more likely you are to succeed. That's not so straightforward. I think what it does though is to suggest that where you ought to be playing is where you've got capacity at the Pareto optimum, right? You should play against that space where you can win and be productive, but you should take into account and use the lens of does it have a low carbon future mm -hmm. and how does that asset play in that carbon constrained world? Mm -hmm. And if you do, it's not that nuclear is good or bad. Nuclear is part of the solution. And in fact, one of the things that I didn't really talk about, but it comes out in every single model, you have to have negative emissions. We need a set of technologies that pull the stuff back out from the atmosphere as opposed to putting it in. And in some cases, it could be as much as 20 to 30 percent of the total that's got to be pulled out. These are fundamentally large technologies which are just now being developed and a group of investors are thinking through what they might do. Branson, for example, uh, has put up a prize of $25 million to think through for the first person who comes along with a series of options that might do it, he'll award one. He's announced the finalists, there are about a half a dozen, and there are really interesting ideas and technology. 
One of them, for example, does work on cement. You saw the numbers from Chinese cement and where that goes. One of the possibilities is you cure your cement in a CO2 bath. When you do that, it absorbs CO2 instead of giving off CO2 in the manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Well, cement's actually a big enough number in the total share of global emissions by sector to be a place you can put it. You saw the Chinese numbers on fertilizer. I was at a, a session that was uh, organized uh, at the um, Livermore National Lab out in California, and they were showing me some of the new technologies for the modification of fertilizer, in which they do is they manufacture a fertilizer which has a semi-permeable membrane. The membrane releases fertilizer and absorbs CO2 and stores it in the soil. That's a really interesting idea, and it scales to fertilizer, which globally is the right scale for the problem. It's not like these are not new technologies. The, one I've, the two that I've just mentioned are both American. We do a great job thinking about some of these things. Will we invest in owning them, in running them, in deploying them? Will we compete on that stage? To me, that's the right kind of question. Not that one sector is necessary. They're all essential. At the moment, we've abdicated in many. We've backed away from the kinds of policies that might support them. We've left it to the private sector, which has got perforce because of demands on its fiduciary responsibilities and its directors to think very, very near term. Very few companies are able to think beyond that fairly short term balance sheet, but it leaves them at an enormous disadvantage against those who have this somewhat longer term view across every sector in the economy. Not that many economies compete across the board. We do, China does, Europe collectively does. That's about it. Mm -hmm. Others are playing in niche markets. So we're competing not only against those with a niche market win, we're competing against those with a big market share, and our own domestic economy is probably going to be insufficient to drive that outcome. It has to be a global play, not just a national play. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, I'm going to open it up for questions. I think we'll take a group, but please state your name and affiliation, question in the form of a question, and wait for the mic, John. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Elkind with the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Um, JP, your picture isn't exactly encouraging. Um, I know that you weren't here to give us a sugar-coated anything. But I am wondering, uh, in this rather pessimistic overall outlook, in terms of U.S. policy, are there areas that you see as most promising for the business of starting to forge consensus, political consensus, about how to move forward on climate. Thanks. Great. Can we take a couple others if there? Good guy, and then we'll have one in the back. Guy, guy Caruso, CSIS. Jonathan, thank you very much for, as always, very clear. One, I'd like your assessment on where do we stand and where do you think we're headed on carbon capture and storage, just as a, one of those many things we need to do. Great. And we'll get this one in the back, and then we'll do another round. Uh, Dan Delory with CCL. Uh, Jonathan, your presentations are always good, but the importance of this one was significant, and I want to congratulate you on that. I want to go back to your slide where you talked about the rest of the world uh, collectively outweighing China. And can you go back over that? And t were you suggesting some sort of action because of that collective stat? Okay, take those. So let me start with John's uh, comment. So you should have seen the slide talk when I started. I was telling Sarah <laughs> earlier that I'd added some optimism to it, I thought. Uh, um, and a part of the question for me is that the seriousness with which the world is approaching this problem is not uh, adequate to the seriousness of the problem. And I think about the numbers that we're getting now and the kinds of disruptions that we're seeing. And you know, I, I, so we, I, I've just moved to California. I've never lived there before. It's an interesting place. Lots of stuff is going on. But you think of it as this kind of very lovely and, and bucolic environment. Uh, last summer, the fires that came through, you could taste the air all the way through San Francisco. Uh, it burned down a substantial part of Mendocino County. Uh, it, it's recovering slowly. It'll take decades probably before it fully recovers. Uh, that's, that's a, that's a, you know, if you think about the scheme of things, so a bunch of wineries go up in smoke, it's a pretty luxury level problem to have, and yet it speaks to that community. I'm struck by the level of investment in the Silicon Valley area, which is where I live. Uh, our foundation is located in Menlo Park. And think about the new building that's been going on in the companies that have chosen to build in San Francisco. Facebook built on the bay. They did not build uh, uh, on pillars. Their first floor is about two feet above sea level. The sea is expected to rise in the Bay Area by about three feet within the next 50 years. 
Uh, I'm looking at where Google is. It's right on the bay. I'm looking at where Oracle is. The guy has been able to moor his catamaran, which he runs the America's Cup in, in the front pool because the pool opens up onto the bay. It's not above sea level. It's been no, and these are all built in the last three years. And I take a look at what's going on. We had a meeting a number of years ago, many of you may recall, we went to Doha, uh, where we had the conference of the parties. This was before Paris. And Doha is an entirely new city built at sea level. At sea level. And they didn't elevate any of their infrastructure like their power plant. Now, at least when New York rebuilt, people like Goldman rebuilt in the same place, but they put all the HVAC work and the generators on the 10th floor. That's going to probably be fine. They might lose the first five, and they probably even lose that much. They'll probably lose the first one but at least all the operating equipment will be safe. Most of the rest of the world's not doing that. These are not damages that are waiting for 100 years to come along. These are damages that you can see today. Sandy was a function partly of the fact that it was a confluence of un unknown, but unpredicted events that would have been normal, partly a consequence of about 10 inches of sea level rise, which overtopped all of New York's barriers. It was sea level rise that made the difference between a damaging event and a catastrophic event. That's the same story in Sandy. That's the same story when you get to Katrina. That's the same story as you get now in the wildfires. That's the same story as you have in Australia with the drought. That's the same story that you're getting in the drying of much of Central Asia. That's the same story in Western China. It's not as if you've got a process or a problem which is not already manifesting difficulty. It's the fact that we have chosen to keep our eyes shut to the damages. With that in mind, what are the potential areas of consensus and how do we think about what's promising? I think the American model is really not yet resolved. I think that we have historically had a view that markets prevail and that if left to their own devices, markets will do very well. Markets are reactive though. Markets are very seldom predictive. And if you take a look at where we've had catastrophic losses in the market, they're mostly because there's been an absence of forward looking thinking. And we tend to do well at status quo, and we can find ways to look at the margins and compete effectively. But even our VC structure is not very well structured for things that have long-term returns. If I'm a computer company and I can get a return in less than five years, I can find all kinds of people who want to invest in where I am. If I'm an energy company and think about looking at investments that are a billion dollars a pop, it's a much more difficult time to get a VC player into that marketplace. That becomes a government play. That's why China does well, because they can steer investment at that scale that becomes a huge window. So where does the US go in that model? I think what's gonna end up happening is we're gonna see different kinds of asset classes coming to the table. I think the shift in places like the pension funds matters a great deal. I think the structure of what's happened in some of the large groups that have assets under management is huge. Mindy Lubers, who runs an organization called Ceres, is thinking about this agenda with a large set of asset players. At her most recent annual meeting in New York a few months ago, she had as several of her keynote speakers, uh, one was from, uh, from State Street and one was from BlackRock. And they're thinking explicitly about what kind of shift there's gonna be in their investing and how they allocate risk. Well, that's one way the market actually pays attention. It's more expensive to get money for some things than for other things. I think that's more likely to drive us out of things that are problematic than necessarily to drive us in to things that are necessary. And that second one to me still requires the government. One of the things that I think was fairly positive, at least seen from the distance of California, was the fact that the budget that was passed only by Congress was not the budget that was proposed. The budget that was passed was essentially flat in many of the areas that were proposed for deep and sharp reductions, including in the areas of technology and R&D. And to me, that's an essential place the government has to play to bring some of those prices down. And Congress has chosen to play there, notwithstanding some of the recommendations that came from the administration. I think we have to fight for those things. I think those things are essential if we're to sustain that long-term structure. And then finally, I think we wanna be very, very wary about reducing our ability to compete overseas. And I think that in this instance, some of the things the Trump administration has proposed, I don't think the, the rhetoric makes any sense to me at all. I think some of the market structures are actually, there's real reason for concern. How do we think about the openness of markets to American competition? How do we think about the Chinese role in its own markets being open or less open? How does that play out in India, which is actually not much less closed than China? How do we manage Japan, which frankly has been better than those two, but not as much better as it should have been? And how do we manage that system? So I think there's gonna be a political play there where if, if the rhetoric doesn't get in our way, the substance might be to our benefit and to open up options for us to play and for others to play as well. So I think it's in that combination of factors that we really have to promote uh, action and, and effort. And then finally, I would say that the actors are not limited to the federal level. If I take a compendium of the states and local governments that are acting aggressively, they amount to an awful lot of change. 
The biggest shift that was happening in China on this bus fleet that I mentioned in Shenzhen did not come from Beijing. It came directly from Shenzhen, just the city. It made a choice, and over a five-year period, it reinvested in a brand new technology. This is really doable. There are cities that want to go down that road and have assets and can borrow money at a reasonable rate to make that possible. Don't dismiss subnational actors in their capacity to make change. Um, Guy, your question on CCS, I think, is, uh, is, is got a couple of different answers. The first one is that I think that in some ways the Chinese were probably right. Uh, over a period of more than a decade, they've argued there has to be a U in CCS. So it's got to be carbon capture use and storage. Uh, and the argument has been, unless there's an economic rationale, and it's not exclusively a government-imposed price on carbon, it'll be very hard to get the process to work at scale. So the thing that I've been kind of excited by are some of these uses that people are proposing that get to the right kinds of levels. Notwithstanding that, the kinds of prices that we're currently seeing are on the order of 500 or more dollars per ton. And if I'm looking at an option of what I could do to reduce carbon, I don't start with a $500 a ton option. I start with something that is less than 100, and if I can get down to three, which is what the price is in Reggie, I'm much happier. So if I take a look at those kinds of structures, the question is, who's gonna make that first investment? I take a look, for example, what's going on uh, uh, in Iceland with a proposal to end up doing some carbon capture and storage. Uh, structures right now at about $600 a ton, so pretty expensive. They're thinking about ways, and it, essentially it's a, a fairly rapid form of carbonization in mineralization. So it gets pretty interesting uses, and they can pull it out from a number of different processes. What's interesting to me about it is that they, if they can get the first investment at 600, for give or take some about 30 to 40 million dollars, they can bring the price down by about a factor of two, which gets you now to 250 to 300. Still much too high, but that's with one investment of 30 to 40 million. That's the kind of thing which foundations can think about. That's the kind of thing which you can get some individual entrepreneurs to think about. It's the kind of thing which some governments ought to be thinking about. And to me, it's a series of those, and it's not probably that many before you then have an intersection between a carbon policy and the CCS price that might be credible. I don't believe that we are at any point in the near future likely to see organizations at scale taking CO2 out of the atmosphere for altruistic purposes. It's too expensive. And I don't see any point right away in which people will do it unless there's some payment. I think one of the most promising things that happened in the CCS debate was the, the 45Q uh, conversation, which many people in this room were involved with, which for the first time began to put a price and Congress is gonna pick up some of that cost with a US subsidy if you can do carbon capture. That's a fabulous first step. The money's not quite enough, but for some marginal things, it may now make the difference. And if you can do some of those, you drive the trajectory. And if you can drive the trajectory, you bring the price to the point where you might be able to afford it when we actually have a serious climate policy. So I think all of those things have a confluence. Uh, I also think that the open question of scale is one that we really haven't considered adequately. These are very small today. If we think we're gonna solve the problem, it's not dependent on doing it only with negative emissions uh, and structures around reducing emissions elsewhere. You have to do that, but you still have a gap. And you won't close the gap, and this doesn't avoid the need to mitigate transport or power or buildings. It adds to that, but we have to start this really soon and scale it very, very fast. So I think the short answer is yes, there are things out there, but it's not adequate. Uh, Dan, your question um, around the rest of the world and where that's headed, uh, I think at the end of the day, it is predicated on at least the assumption that United States, Europe, China meet the goals they've set for themselves. And those goals uh, continue over time. And at that point, the rest of the world will be much larger. If, in fact, China and the US and Europe don't meet their goals, they will probably still be larger than the rest of the world. So part of it's a, the initial assumption about what's happening in, the, in that space. But the second one is, what do you believe about those countries? Essentially, what's modeled in virtually every model is that China, India, Europe, uh, Japan act against the commitments that they've set for themselves. And the rest of the world delays action. And they delay it from anywhere from 30 to 50 years. And so as a consequence, they've got pretty substantial growth. I'm not sure that I believe that any more than I believe the numbers the IAA has got around the fact that there's no electrification of the automobile fleet. I think they're both wrong, but for different reasons. So in the case here of the structure for the developing countries and the rest of the world, what makes you believe that if India is able to deeply decarbonize its transport sector, as is China, that Africa, which buys all of its cars from India and China, will no longer buy those cars, but will start manufacturing its old internal combustion engine cars on its own? You think that why? 
They won't. They'll buy the Indian and Chinese cars. Maybe they'll have joint ventures because a lot of them are going to be manufactured in those places. But they'll be making things maybe on a five-year lag, on a seven-year lag, maybe a 10-year lag, but not much more than that. So the shift there, in my mind, is probably an incorrect assessment about what the ROW group does. The second question to me is, what kind of model do we anticipate around development in the world? And to me, this is a huge question, which is only partly touching on the climate question. But let's take a look at the world in 2050, against which we've succeeded with all of these kinds of changes. What does that world look like? So we think we've got deep decarbonization in the power sector. How much of it is distributed generation and how much of it centralized? I don't know. I assume more distributed than we've got today. That might play out in a really interesting way for Africa. Are those jobs that are ending up local? Let's suppose you still make almost all your solar panels now in some combination of India and China, and they're shipped out to Africa. It's all local jobs installing those things. Are there more local jobs available there than there are centralized power plant jobs? Almost certainly yes. What's the car fleet look like? To a certain extent, this is a problem that plays out for us as well as for others, but the labor market questions here are huge. An electric vehicle has got at least 20% fewer parts and a better than 40% improvement on the repair record. What about all those people who made the parts in the supply chain? They were all over the world. What are they going to do? What are those mechanics who actually ran your, 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 your repair system? Where do they go? What's the new model? It is something different in that new economy than it is today. And how does Africa play into that space? Is it still a resource extraction economy? Turns out if you look at the oil supply which runs our fleets today, it is fundamentally different than the battery parts and chemicals and minerals that run our fleets of tomorrow. Who owns the latter? A pretty substantial share in the rest of the world. How does that look for an extractive industry and who's buying that competition and what are the countries who own that capacity or productive potential, what are they doing? So to me, this is where the model plays out and this much more complicated frame where there are all these other parts in the system is what we deeply have to look at. And then finally, I would say, what do you think about the big new investors of the future? Will the US play? So I was in South Africa when I was the envoy uh, at the State Department uh, and had some meetings and it turns out that many of you may know but US embassies around the world uh, on July 4th have big parties and uh, they're big parties for all the people they work with and it's a chance to kind of celebrate what the US brings to the table and they're always very nice affairs. I was in South Africa for one a few years back and the ambassador hosted what was an incredibly interesting event and get all the business people there and it was really quite interesting and he put up a slide in which he put rank ordered those companies from around the world who were investing in Africa and this was South Africa in particular. The United States was number three. China was number one. China was uh, twice as big as the next, or as big as the next two combined. Number two was Germany. Number three was the US. You kind of think about what that structure looks like. We've decided that we're not gonna play in Africa. Well, that's where the rest of the world starts playing. What about Southeast Asia? That's right now become an enormous growth market. Who's investing in Vietnam? Who's in Thailand? Who's thinking about Indonesia? These are not straightforward places necessarily, but China sure as hell is going gangbusters in making those investments, and they're quite profitable. Who's investing in Latin America? That's traditionally been a place the United States has had recourse and access, and we've decided that we're gonna kind of withdraw from many of our conversations there in ways that don't serve our economy. To me, that's the rest of the world discussion, and the investment potential and the opportunity is enormous, and how do we seize that? It's our choice. We don't have to walk back and say, sorry, I want to play at home. We can say, I want to play globally because that's good for me at home. That's my view of where we succeed, but if we don't, we create a vacuum. And when that vacuum is created, there are many others who are happy to rush in and fill it. Rest of the world. Okay, I'm gonna take three more. You're gonna to have to be faster. Uh, <laughs> we'll go Tim here and then uh, right here. Good morning, uh, Tim Donatera, Alpha Investments. You highlighted effectively a sector that we really haven't talked about um, when you talked about the building of Doha and Silicon Valley buildings and a number of the, the need for a trillion dollars a year investment in these areas and that's the financing and the insuring businesses that to date, particularly in the U.S., are sort of not, are absent in the conversation and in fact in some cases are um, ignoring the situation from either a regulatory perspective, we're allowing them from a regulatory perspective or from an operational perspective. And I'll use this one bit of evidence and I'll end the question. In Jamie Dimon's uh, most recent 47 page letter to their sharehold his shareholders, where he mentioned every risk known to man except climate change or the environment um, is indicative of where our U.S. financial institutions are. Where do you see the role of organizations like the Hewitt Foundation or 
clearly it's not going to come from the federal government currently, states and other entities to push to require pricing in longer term tail risks around climate in the financial and insurance businesses. Okay. And then we're going to go right down on the blue tie. Okay. <laughs> Jan. Jan Mayer's Resources for the Future. Um, thank you very much for your extraordinary presentation. My concern about what you're saying, Jonathan, is that I think that until a much larger portion of the U.S. citizenry, particularly those between the coasts, really think this issue is important and they're willing to pay some money for it one way or another, we're not going to get there. And I wonder whether an organization like you or others ought to be doing more in that space and maybe a little less in some of these other things. Okay, and then the woman in the green shirt right here, please. Did you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think we should both I, go. Yeah. Okay. You can, like, thumb wrestle. So, uh, Claire, uh, my name's Claire Healy with E3G. Um, loads of questions, but I'll pick two. Um, does the Paris Agreement survive if we don't get the ratchet mechanism to work? Two, you said we're all guilty of making China the bogeyman because nobody's engaging with China. Who should engage and how? So it's Sarah's request to be brief. Yes. <laughs> um, so Tim, in response to your question, uh, we have to think about scale. Uh, the foundation world collectively working on climate, uh, just over $500 million a year. The United States government all by itself in the climate space, which includes the satellite, so it's kind of a bit of a, of a false number, is 10 billion, just the US. So the answer is no, the foundations can do catalytic work, can support programs, but the scale is just off. So somebody else is going to have to make the investment, although we can catalyze policy, and that becomes critical. And who are the others, and how do you think about the tail risk? Actually, foundations can help catalyze tail risk. And how do you think about that agenda, and how do you elevate that conversation? That's an academic discussion. That's an advocacy discussion. That's a think tank discussion. Ultimately, that's a government discussion. Governments do tail risk. That's part of their job. Some do it better than others. Some think about it more effectively than others. But I think that part of our role in this kind of a community is to help address that particular uh, Jan, your question was uh, around the center and where the rest of the country is. And I, I actually am struck by the fact that when you look at polling data, and I take a look at uh, Lazarowitz's numbers out of Yale, who does some pretty nice polling on a regular basis and looks at the country across the board, the country actually believes that climate change is a problem. Our politicians don't, and that clearly is a barrier. And so how we reflect the views of our country in the actions of our politics remains a much more pressing problem than just around the climate agenda. It's the same problem around guns. People are prepared to do something, but Congress and many legislators don't want to. It's the same question around jobs. People are prepared to do something, but we haven't found ways to reach political coherence on an action agenda. So I think we have a lot more agreement in the nation than we've got political capacity to implement that agreement at our political level. And that speaks to a very fundamental issue in my mind. Having said that, I'm also struck by the cities and the states across the middle who are acting. I take a look at what was done in Ohio, where the governor decides to actually, over the objections of his legislature, support an agenda to promote renewables, because frankly, it's a lot cheaper, and it's working pretty well for Ohio, and there's a manufacturing component that attaches to that. That's the kind of agenda that we have to sustain. I think we're getting that. Texas has got more installed capacity than California. It's really, really interesting to think about where that community lies. And we're seeing objections on other fronts as well. I'll be really curious to see what else may happen in Oklahoma around the teacher strike. Um, uh, the, the last question around does Paris survive? I think the answer, of course, Paris survives. Paris survives not because of the United States. The United States is one player. Everybody else is in and is actually acting. I think what's really going to be interesting is will there be US, will there be consequences to the US of being out? At the moment, I think the argument is not politically, people are prepared to give the US a pass. I think it's much more in terms of investment. I think it's much more in terms of the coherence and the competitiveness of the market. In my mind, and that's kind of the basic thesis that I've got, is that essentially we do best when we support the market outcomes that we as a nation have succeeded with. We don't do best by abdicating and leaving that open. We got enormous benefits from helping write the rules of Paris. We got benefits from writing the rules of trade. We got benefits from writing the rules in the post-war era around the Bretton Woods agreements. Those were things that were beneficial and we were walking away from them, in my mind, losing that advantage. Someone else is gonna write the next set of rules. Will there be a set of rules that work as well for us? I don't know. I think if we play, they could, because we're an influential player. I think if we don't play, it won't work that well, but we should not hold our breath that the world's gonna stop while we reorganize the State Department. At the end of the day, I don't think China's the boogeyman, 
And in my mind, the whole question of, of who engages them is everybody. China is remarkably open to being engaged. It's startling to me how they do this. So I had a meeting, this, this uh, uh, group called the CCICED, which has some incredibly long acronym, but it's essentially <laughs> a group that's looking at uh, Chinese environment and development. It's chaired uh, by Catherine McKenna, uh, who's the Minister of Environment for Canada, and by her counterpart, who's the Minister of Environment for China. And they bring in about 150 people, and they do a whole session on a variety of environmental issues, a substantial part of which these days is about climate change, and they go and brief the, the, the president. Which model do we have in this country where you can get 100 people from outside the nation convening around an agenda which they think makes sense and then go brief the president? It's very unusual. You can get in and talk to senior figures in China, and they're largely engineers by training. They're technocrats in many ways to the system through which they came. They listen. They may not agree, but they listen, they engage, and very often they act. It's startling to me how receptive they are to policy recommendations. They have other agendas. They operate in a very different way than we do, but it's not the boogeyman. It's just a different system. And we have to go out there, we have to talk to them, we have to think about what they're doing, and they're playing around the world, and they're not averse to having those conversations, but they also perceive themselves as wanting to put some distance between their interests and those that might come. Now that's a bit of a perverse problem, and I look at the Belt and Road as an example. I'm China, I come to Vietnam with a pledge for a billion dollar coal plant. Vietnam goes, God, a billion dollars, I'll take it. Doesn't think to say, I would prefer your billion dollars if it went into a renewable facility or a transport facility, could you do that instead? Were they to say that, China actually might say yes. But China didn't start with that. China started with the overhang on coal and goes with a billion dollar coal plant. Are we working in Vietnam to reshape that? What's happening to Bechtel? Are they playing in the model of an infrastructure play as to go to Thailand or Vietnam or Indonesia and looking to supplement that? Very, very interesting. Before he stepped down from GE, Jeff Immelt did a, a, a session with, uh, with John Kerry when he'd gone to Yale. It's a big conference that they had in the last meeting. And Jeff's most significant thing that he wanted to tell the entire audience, and there were a thousand people in the audience, was that they'd worked out a deal where GE was getting money for China to invest in the Belt and Road countries. That's an interesting model. GE was doing very well a lot of that deal. So to me, that's an engagement that we have not used to our advantage. Uh, Jonathan, you are one of our favorite strategic thinkers here at CSIS, and uh, it's been a pleasure to have you. You've awoken like a zillion questions, so I can't, we can't possibly tackle all of them, but hopefully you'll be able to chat with some people after the event. Um, thank you very much for spending your time here today, and I hope you'll come back and do it again. Thanks, Thanks. very much.